you, the ancients of days, the roots of Jesse. We welcome you. Ah, uh, Daddy, we welcome you tonight. Holy Spirit of a living God, come thank on. we welcome you tonight, oh God. Have your way in our midst. Have your way. Touch every heart in this place, oh God, on this platform tonight. Uh, let your people be receptive to your word. Every heart oh, of, yes, Lord. Heart of flesh tonight, oh God. It's all about you, Jesus. Have Take dominion, take authority. Your power belongs to you, oh God. Father, we bless you, Jesus. Take all the glory. Bless you. Take all the glory, Jesus. Father, we bless your name. You are here in the midst of us. Father, we yes. thank you. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Mr. Reading. Father. Hallelujah. Father Lord, hallelujah. Hallelujah to you. Hallelujah. 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 My God. Hallelujah, 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 you're my God. So Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, you're my God. And hallelujah. And hallelujah. Hallelujah, you're my God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, you're my God. Oh, Hallelujah, 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 you're my God. Oh, hallelujah, 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 you're my God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, you're my God. Oh, has the deer panted for the waters of my soul longs after you? Oh, you alone. Ah, my arms desire and I long to worship you. For you alone are my strength and my shield. To you alone my spirit yields. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Oh, Lord, I long to worship you. Oh, as the deer panted for the waters of my soul longs after you. Oh, you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship you. 
for you alone are my strength and true to you alone my spirit yields oh you alone are my heart's desire and i know to worship you father lord i long to worship you oh father i long oh i long to worship you my soul thirsts for you i long to worship you father lord i long Oh, I long to worship you, Father, I long to worship you, to worship you, I live, to worship you, I live, I live to worship you. Oh, to worship you, I live, to worship you, I live, I live, to worship you. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh, oh. If you have nothing else to say, just hum with me. Oh, 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 just hum until the most high. He understands every word that you hum. Oh, oh, oh. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live, I live to worship you. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live, I live to worship you. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh, oh. Anytime I call, you answer. And anytime I knock, you open. You're an incredible God. Incredible God. Incredible God. You're an incredible God. Incredible God. Incredible God. Anytime I call you answer. Oh, anytime I call, anytime I knock you open, you're an incredible God. Incredible God. Incredible God. You're an incredible, incredible God, incredible God, incredible God, extraordinary strategy, impossibility specialist. You're seated in heaven. You made the earth your footstool. Incredible God. I say it again. Anytime. Impossibility strategist. You're seated in heaven. You made the earth your footstool. 
You're incredible, God, oh Lord. You're an incredible, incredible, God, incredible, God. Incredible, God, oh Lord. You're an incredible, 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 God. Incredible God, oh Lord, you're incredible. You're an incredible, you do all things incredible, God. Nothing's impossible, incredible God. You're an incredible God, incredible God. Incredible God, Father Lord, we give you all the glory. You're an incredible God, incredible God, incredible God. Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you. You specialize in the impossible. There is none like you. Father, we worship you in the beauty of your holiness. None can compare to you, O oh God, of the many things that you do on our behalf, the many wars you fight on our behalf, the many things that obviously you, you do for us. Father, we thank you. Every time we knock, you answer. Every time we come, you open the door to us. You are such a loving father to us. We are grateful. I'm going to just lift up your hands in this place, wherever you are. And just say, Father, Lord, I just thank you. Father, I give you praise because you are an incredible God. You are an incredible God. None can compare to you, oh God. Impossibility specialist, we thank you. Seated in heavens, we bless your name. You make the earth your footstool. Father, we bless your name. We lift up your name tonight. We worship you. Lord, you are God all by yourself. In Jesus' mighty name. Good evening, church. Good evening. Blessed Friday, everybody. Uh, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. I don't know what kind of week you have had, but I have had a testimony-filled week, and I thank God for his goodness. The fact that we're here, we are alive, we thank God. You know, every time we see the breaking of another day, we have to say thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you tonight. Thank you even as you would minister grace to your people. Fill our hearts with understanding tonight and insight, oh God. Help us to apply your word in every area of our life and we gain stability as we walk with you tonight, oh God. Open the eyes of our understanding. Illuminate us, oh God, as we go into your word tonight. Speak to every one of us. Speak to every heart of stone in this place. Let it become a heart of flesh. Let your people be willing in the day of your power. As we speak tonight, as we deliberate tonight, as we teach tonight, Father, we ask that you will inhabit even our praises tonight, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we decrease. I decrease that you might increase tonight. Holy Spirit, you are the greatest teacher. Teach us, oh God. We need no man teach us, but Lord, you will teach us. You are the greatest teacher. He said, you will lead us into all truth. Tonight, oh God, reveal yourself and your word to us in a new and a higher dimension, such that none of us will live the same way we came in. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of our God. We're just going to start very quickly because of time. I have quite a bit to cover, but the Holy Spirit will help us. So I know, I hope everybody's read the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I pray you have, but I'm going to just speed read um, the, this first uh, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. I am going to be reading. So please join me. It says, now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly. Like a thief in the night, when people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We won't belong. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. 
Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other, build each other up, just as you are already doing. Hallelujah. So the topic of my deliberation today is stand alert. I'm sure you saw that in my, one of my texts that I read. You know, this book of First Thessalonians, we've been, we started about three weeks ago, and it really is a very practical book by Paul. You know, um, it, the thing about it is obviously Paul was writing this, he stayed in Thessalonica for, for, for a short time, the church there. And it was a very short time, but it was amazing even in the shortness of that and how much impact he was able to make in their lives. And every single one of them out there obviously got the word and they received the word. Now, concerning this, so if you go back to chapter four, just a quick, if you go one, one step backwards, because obviously just to say, and I think verse 16 there says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet and call of God. First, the believers who have died. So this is just a prelude and a precursor to chapter five. Because he says on here, what's been happening, people are talking about, and really generally, if you have been alive for a while, people have been the end of the world. When is this judgment day? When is this day of the Lord? In fact, if you go through the internet, there's been a lot of things said about the end of time. Somebody will say, oh, no, it's happening in 1998. It's yet reasons why the world should come to an end. They say, oh, why 2K? 2000, everything is wiping out. In fact, a lot of people have lost their lives because of all this falsehood that has obviously come forth at different times concerning this thing, that the world is coming to an end. But this is what it says in here, because it's obvious that a lot of them have not read the Bible. Because the Bible says expressly here, which we know, Paul says, I don't need to tell you about these things. You people know. Because he says there expressly, we will not know the time. So we have a lot of people. We have spent a lot of time trying to decipher. Okay, what hour? Okay, what day? 88 times. Multiply this by what Daniel said. Add all this together, and then you will get this end of time. This is when the world is going to end. 1848, they said. So for the last 2,000 years, people are still waiting. That is going to happen. You know, but I submit to you tonight that when, I mean, this whole thing about the coming of Christ is not about when we know beyond the shadow of doubt it is going to happen. And as believers, we must know and live in the consciousness of that fact. This coming really is going to be the reality of one generation, but it must be in the consciousness of every single child of God. Every one of us must live like it is happening tomorrow or it is happening today. The Bible says very quickly, uh, Matthew 24, 36, says, however, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the son himself, only the father knows. So we have had people that have computed numbers, calculated years, added ages to it, you know, Y2K, 1888, it will happen today. You know, and yet, in fact, people have been disappointed. He says also in Mark 13, 32, just to buttress it, however, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the son himself, only the father knows. Acts chapter one, verse seven says again, he replied, the father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. They are not for you to know. So we have spent a lot of time and everybody has said, no, this is what's going to happen. We have spoken about it. Paul is just trying to remind the church here that there is a truth we must eat because a lot of the times as we live through life, our life takes different directions. We live and we forget the reality of what is going to happen. We must live with the consciousness of this, really without a shadow of that, without forgetting that this is going to happen. But as life carries on and we move on with life, we forget. Because the Bible says that we are going to be caught off. Rapture is coming. And if you look at that verse 3, it depicts it with two things. It says, like a thief in the night. And the second, it says, a pregnant woman. So I have been I'm fortunate enough to have experienced both. <laughs> so a few years ago, you know, I was in a house and obviously thieves came in. And it was unannounced. It's only, you don't know where I came from, but some place that I came from, that the thieves will write you a letter. 
that we are coming tomorrow. <laughs> and you have to be aware, you know? But I was at home. I was pregnant and things broke in. It was not announced. I did not know. But they came in and they took the keys and they drove away with the car. And this is the same thing we're talking. And this is what, you know, Paul is here likening the coming to this. And it goes again to say, like the pregnant woman, you don't know when labor is coming. I mean, at that time, you didn't have all those sonographers and everybody to check for you. Okay, this is the, you, as you are sitting, labor grips you. The child does not announce it's coming. Whether your EDD date is next week or two weeks ago or two, two weeks time, you do not know. Labor pain grips you. And that's what the Bible is expressing here. And that's what Paul is expressing to this church. So that I need to remind you that this thing is going to happen like a thief in the night, unannounced, like the labor pains of a pregnant woman, it will happen. But what we need to do, he says, and there is no escape. This judgment is coming. And really it's about how we live our lives that we determine. We cannot avoid it. And we cannot even pretend it's not coming. It says, verse four, we cannot. It's like some people will still be saying peace and security or oh, everything is okay. We're living our lives. After all, you know, they'd be saying it's going to come and it hasn't happened. Just then, it would appear. Will you be ready? Is the word. Are you alert enough? Are you aware? Are you standing on guard for when this is going to happen? It says you cannot escape it. You might that talks about in verse, verse four talks about being, because it says it would happen, but there's a way of escape for you and I, because we are children of light. Are we living in that perpetual light? Is that light is still a reality? Are we still on a daily basis a child, a child of light, a child of the day? Or are we casting all that aside and we have lost hope in that expectation and we're thinking, well, it has not happened for the last 2,000 years and therefore I can carry on as I choose to. That will not be your portion in the name of Jesus. You know, he will not overtake the believers. Every single person will be audited. The time is when we would all be audited. So if you had a tax man and he says to you, oh, um, Minister Antonia, your tax will be audited uh, in, I don't know, April 2022. And you know, so you're meant to keep your receipts, keep your tickets, you know, every invoice you get, you're meant to file it. Because if you know that by the time they come and you have not got your books in order, everything will be taken from you. So just in that same example, are we living like we're going to be audited someday? Is our life being lived as though that audit, that accountant, HMRC of heaven are going to come in? Are we expressing that in our daily living? There is no escape. But he says there is a rescue for children of God, you like you and I, who are auditing our accounts work. Well. We need to be children of light. Verse 6 says, we, I mean, the gospel has rescued us. It will rescue us. It will not catch us, for we know it's coming and we're prepared. And we need to live in the consciousness of this fact. The topic of my deliberation again is be alert. Now, verse 6, verse, verse 8, very quickly, it talks about what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Let me just read verse eight very quickly because of time. Um, verse eight. It says there, so be on your guard. That's verse six. Verse eight says, but let us who live in light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith. In fact, it says, be serious, be ready. That's another transition. Be alert, be attentive, preparing for what is to come. Be disciplined. If you read the Amplified Version, he says, be disciplined. He says, but let us who live in the light be protected by the armor of faith. You know, it's amazing when he says, be serious. He says, be alert, be on guard. And when he's going to talk about it, he says, let us be protected by the armor of faith, which means it is a battle. You don't need armor where there is no fight. There is a seriousness about how we live life as children of God. There is an urgency about how we, so he says, the armor of faith and love. Then he says the helmet of salvation. 
Are we living, knowing that life is a battle? To live as a child of God on this side of the earth is a battle. And he's saying, you know, we need to watch and we need to pray. Because the Bible says in Matthew 26, 40, it said that this was when Jesus went up to pray. And he said to Peter, he gets one, he said, couldn't you watch for whom one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. When he returned, they were sleeping. Would he find you and I sleeping when he returns? We must be people who have who live in life and must be disciplined. If you remember the story of the ten virgins in uh, Matthew twenty-five, I can't read the whole chapter because it's but what verse one of us says. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. May the door not be locked on you in Jesus' name. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, open the door. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. Because they were not ready. Are we living our lives, being alert, like we are going to be audited tomorrow? Following Christ is not a game. And that's why he's using those things. He's talking about the armor of faith. Paul is reminding us here as people of faith. Believe, we must believe. Even when you don't see him, you must trust him. You must trust what he did on Calvary. That's where your faith is. You must believe in him wholeheartedly, dying to self. Faith in you, in God, and living my life, patterning my life after him, after his precepts, after his ordinance, listening, listening to his word. That's how God has asked you and I to live, to be alert, to be on guard. And so this is a, a, a verse of scripture that a lot of people, they don't want to hear. We don't want to study it because it's not, it's a bit kind of judgmental, but it is real. It is going to happen. And God has made a way of escape for you and I. But are we living in the light of that way of escape is the question. You know, I said, so I may not understand him. I may not even be able to trace God sometimes, but I must have faith. My faith must be solid that I know in whom I trust. I know in whom I believe. I know what he did for me on Calvary. And I know without a shadow of doubt that he will rescue me. He has rescued me. And he also says here, the armor of love. What is that? You know, you love God, you love your neighbor. You embrace those around you and care for their need. You share with others. Listen, the reason why it's an armor of love is so that a lot of people will miss the mark. But your love must be able to, pro the love must propel you to tell them about what Christ has done. That they will be rescued as well. So on one hand, you have faith, but you must really have that love to compel you to minister the word to other people so they do not face perdition. And that's what this is. And that's what exactly what is. They must be rescued from that rough. Don't turn a blind eye. You see your neighbor, you see your brother, they're going along, they're going astray. And we're just looking at them thinking, well, that's their problem. I don't want anybody to speak to me. Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? This is Paul admonishing these people, the people in Thessalonica. He says also, the last one is the helmet of salvation, the hope of salvation. This is the expectation of how we must live. We must live in the security of our salvation so that even when you fall into sin, you must understand that I get up again because there is a better tomorrow. This word I am at is only temporary. I am not here for life. I am only passing through. And that's the hope of our salvation. That's the helmet. So when your mind is wandering and you're thinking, well, the helmet of salvation is what should guide you. It's the hope of your salvation. That say, no, 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 come back, my son. There is a greater tomorrow. Glory is ahead. There is a greater glory. There is something to look forward to. You are not going to die in this. Amen? So it's just a bit, very quickly, just a bit like, you know, when you say you want to have a sports test in class and they say to you, and so you must be ready. You know, the Boy Scouts motto is be prepared. We must be ready. Because at any point in time, it will come. And so verse 11 talks about you encouraging one another, build up one another. We need to remind ourselves that this world where it is very temporary, it is not our home. Christ is coming and we need to be serious about our faith. I beg you, we must share the gospel and our hope of salvation must be able to get us up to get other people up and say, look, no. And when you go quickly and because of time, when you get to verse 12, wow. Verse 12, I'm going to just round you up very quickly. You know, you know, so it talks about 
uh, that these are Christian conducts. We're talking about obviously how life is, how we should live our lives, what we should do. This is possible admonishing them. You know, so he said, it talks about how we respond to people in positions of authority. You know, there are ones that talk about you praying for the leaders, the leaders that are amongst you by what they do, the ones that are over you, the authority to lead you, admonish you, the ones that are warning you and saying, look, they're cautioning you like we're doing tonight. That look, there is a greater glory. Don't just wallow here. We need to pray for leaders, even the heads of homes. The Bible says in the book of 1 Timothy 2, 2, we need to pray for kings and those in authority. You must esteem them. The heads of homes, I mean, everybody is a leader. You are the head of a home today. We must pray for you because family is the fabric of any nation. When you strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. And yet they're meant to be this to admonish you, to caution you. When you're going astray, they're meant to reel you back and say, no, come back. So we must pray for them. And to the leaders, I say to you, everyone here is a leader, lead by example. Lead by, you are going to give an account to God, how your children, how you are going to give an account, the flock under you, your spiritual children, you are going to give an account. So we must ensure that we do. So please let's all understand this. And, I tell, and it says also, be at peace in your relationships. Bible says, as much as within your power, be at peace. These are Christian conducts. It was just really not conducts that we must live to ensure that we are not, uh, that we are not left behind to ensure that we are rescued. These are things that we must do as believers. There's a lot here. It was just like shotgun of instructions. Do this, checklist for the church, for you and I. Remember, you know, and it talks about, I think it's in um, verse 14. He talks about different types of categories of people. There's that the people, some people are weak. Some people are, are lazy. Some people are fretters. Some, you know, some people are warriors. Some people are faint hearted. So it means that there is a different response to everybody. This is what Paul is admonishing them. That there are all sorts of people here and you must be ready to respond to them. I said, you cannot repay evil for evil. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord, Romans 12, 9. He said, you do not avenge, do not repay evil because they were facing persecution. And he was saying, them, look, no, God just leave, the tables will turn around. God will visit them with the same persecution that they are persecuting you. So sometimes we go through issues we need to be long-suffering. We need to be tolerant of one another. These are Christian attributes that we must embrace. Are you standing at alert? Are we staying alert? Are we mindful of his coming? And it says also, rejoice always. There's a, your connection to Jesus must be so real that you are totally, you know, always, always rejoicing. He says, rejoice again, I say always, Philippians 4, 4, rejoice. There's no time for moping around. There is a greater hope. There is a greater glory ahead. Let me read something to you very quickly. Minister Antonia, can you please help me? It's Romans chapter five, verse two to five. This scripture gives me a lot of assurance. Very quickly. Whoa, we're finishing off in a minute. You, are you there? Romans, Romans chapter five. Yeah, verse two, two to five. five. Yes. Uh, by whom also we have access by faith, into yes. his grace, wherein we stand yeah. and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not yes. only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing That's that tribulation right. worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because yeah. the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Thank you. Thank you. So you can imagine that when you go through these challenges, like this, we were going through this persecution, what is your response? How do you respond to it? Because the Holy Spirit has shared the love of God in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And he said, I would avenge it. So hold your peace. Because by the time you start to get angry, you want to give a piece of your mind. By the time you get their issues, you want to retaliate. But God is saying, no, vengeance is mine. The love of God has been shared abroad in our hearts. This persecution brings in you character, patience, long-suffering. These are the fruits of the Spirit. If we're going to make it and we're going to be rescued, we need to ensure that we stay along. We, don't, we live a life worthy of Christ himself. 
and we need to rejoice always. Pray without ceasing every single time. The verse 19 says, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there, you know, do not allow unforgiveness, unbelief to quench the Holy Spirit. We, Holy Spirit, we are dependent on the Holy Spirit for every single thing we do. We cannot make a move without the Holy Spirit. So we're still talking about this time and this season, this day that is coming. But how do we get our house in order? How do we ensure we stay alert? How do we ensure that we are still standing when he comes and we have not compromised our faith? And we've got still the, the armor of faith and the armor of love and the helmet, the hope of salvation by the time he comes. Oh, hallelujah. Are you getting something tonight? I just need to hear from you. Give me a thumbs up. <laughs> it's so vital that as children of the most high, you know, this is not a season to play games. This is not a season to be asleep. This is not a season to veer away from his purpose, from his precepts, whatever he has called you to do. This is the time to do it. You can see the signs are all there. I mean, somebody said to me, oh, I think it will happen in the next 15 years. I, I'm like, well, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I live my life and you should live your life with the consciousness that it might be tomorrow. That it might be, you know, and we must ensure, like I said, it's going to be the reality of a generation, but it must be in the consciousness of every single one of us. That it is going to happen and there's not going to be any escape. The fact that we're rescued from it is determined by what we do by that time. What we do with the time that we're in now. What are you and I doing? Amen. You know, it all talks about being at peace with people. You know, verse Hebrews 12, 14 says, work at living in peace with everyone. Living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting men. Because verse 23 says, God, make them holy. The Bible says, without holiness, no one will see God. Make them holy. We need to strive for that. Christ in us is working through us. And the Bible says, he will do it. And Paul says he wants God to work in us in every single area of our life and in every way, every part of us, to make us, we need to be, we need to live a holy life. We need to live a holy life. The Bible says in Luke 10, 27, the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with everything. You and I must get to a level and a consciousness where it doesn't matter what's going on around us. We are sold out to Christ. Our lives are worthy of being called children of God. In our thoughts, in our actions, in our deed. The Bible says in John 17, 17, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Sanctify us by your word. Your word is truth. The word of God must be something we embrace on a daily basis. It teaches us. It helps us. And lastly, as Paul says, pray for me. You know, even Paul understands that this is on a journey. And this journey is not easy. So even he covers your prayer. Just by writing half of the New Testament, he says we should pray for one another. He says we should pray for him. He says love each other. You know, the tough days ahead. The tough days, we are living in tough days. They were living in tough times. And then he said, greet each other with a holy kiss. I mean, that's probably a bit dangerous right now. <laughs> I said, Dickie, please give Mr. Ray with a holy kiss. <laughs> So, you know, in these days where, you know, obviously can't, but it's so important that we care for one another. We are mindful of each other. We must ensure because God will cause everything to work together for our good. Amen. So a li living a life, last verse, living a life without Christ is living a life without purpose. We must study God's word. And that's what Paul says in the last bit of it. Ensure that this, this book, Sorry, I'm just getting to the end of it. So, and Paul says, I command you in the name of the Lord to read this letter to all the brothers and sisters. Everybody. 
This word, we must ensure that we spread the word, spread the gospel. This letter, this admonition, this Christian conduct, this last day, this eschatology, you must ensure that you pass it to every single one you come in contact with. Because they must know, they must be rescued. You're meant to minister love to them, minister salvation to them. That's who we are. By their fruit, you will know that we should bear those fruits. And God will help us in Jesus' name. So let me quickly move. And he said, the last thing there, verse 28, said, may the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. You know, the great grace is everything. Grace is everything. Grace helps us. He enables us. He carries us. Grace is the lubricant in our work with God. Without grace, we are nobody. We cannot end anywhere. You know, we need the grace of God to carry us through. By works, we cannot be justified by works. We need grace. We thank God for his blood. So all this conduct is saying you need the grace to enable you. And so we must rely solely on the grace of God. And so please, I beg you, we stay alert as believers. Very quickly, 2 Thessalonians, uh, cha Thessalonians verse chapter 1. And I'm going to do this quickly also. It's, all, it's not a very big verse, but I think that we need to, we need to talk about this. This book was written a few months. So, you know, a few months after the first book was written, um, obviously people were having issues because at this point in time, they had started facing persecution, huge persecution. And, you know, Paul was admonishing them here. Let me read. This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We are writing to the church in Thessalonica, to you who belong to God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. May our God, may God, our Father, and the grace of Christ be upon you give you grace and give you peace. He says, dear brothers and sisters, can't help but thank God for you. You know, it's important. This is another thing that I want to say to us. Even when we go out and minister to these people, you cannot have children, spiritual children, and leave them because the devil is there to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You must ensure that you pray for them constantly. You pray for them daily. The people that you have brought to Christ, you must ensure that they are still on that journey. They are still on that walk. You must admonish them. You must edify them. You must encourage them. That's just a sidetrack. So we must know any bond that you're coming, let the love compel you to finish the work. Very important. So say, dear brothers and sisters, can't help but thank God for you. And this is for make boasting and say, look, I came. We proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness in the persecutions and hardships you are suffering. How many of us can God boast about? How many of us can God say, look, no, I know my child, like he boasted about Job. In this market of life, or do we compromise at the first instance? Do we take the easy way out at the first instance? Or we stand up for righteousness and truth? We stand up for holiness. That if I perish on this matter, I perish, I will not compromise, I will not renounce you. Or do we just, well, I'm sorry, I don't really know what to do. But this is Paul saying to those people, I, I, I am proud. I proudly boast about you. They are closer to God and they love for one another. And the persecution they were going through brought them even together. Hence the boast by Paul. And that is the mark of the true Christian. Now, even when challenges come, how do you respond? What is your response? And I'm sure in that, in that Thessalonica, because they were really persecuting them. I'm sure they had new children of God. They didn't like them. So I'm sure they would have been losing businesses. They would have been losing friends. And how many of us does that happen to at work today? Oh, you are a fanatic. Oh, you know, you are an odd person. Oh, you don't believe in God. And all of us are actually afraid to profess what we believe or who we are. And what we do is we blend. And then there's no difference between who we are. And then when we have to do that lie, we still lie as well because there is absolutely no difference. But Paul is saying no. And God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. So God is not blind to your suffering. He's not blind to what you're going through. So this persecution they are experiencing, this struggle, he says, God is saying, through this, you will be worthy of my kingdom. Through these challenges, you will be worthy of my kingdom. Paul needed to encourage them more, knowing that obviously, you know, the Bible says in the book of Matthew 5, 10 to 12, it says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and all sorts of evil against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. For a great reward awaits you. 
in heaven. I remember even the Asian prophets were persecuted in the same way. Be glad when this happens. But a lot of us crawl and we go back because we do not want it. We do not want people to know that we're Christian. We don't want them to know we're believers. When you're going through trials and challenges, you may need, in fact, and sometimes, you know, if you are living a life where nobody is questioning you, nobody is looking at you and thinking funny, you need to question your work. Because Jesus himself was persecuted. You cannot, and that's who the image that we're meant to be like. So if everything is okay, the sinners love you. You know, the drunks love you. The prostitutes love you. You are the liberal and everyone. You need to check your work with God. Because somebody must, light and darkness cannot coexist. You are a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. When you're walking on a child of light, surely the kingdom of darkness will not like it. And it will bring up opposition against you. And it's what you do with that opposition that demarcates who you are. So tonight I want us to obviously take stock. Take stock. Take stock. I mean, the Bible says in verse 6, God will turn the table on them. So your suffering is proof that you are worthy, especially your response to persecution. The tables will turn on them. And those that are persecuting you, God will, they will visit them with vengeance on your behalf. So this affliction is just a, for a season. Verse 9 says, judgment as much as it's not pleasant to hear, because a lot of people write and say, well, you know, but God, if you're really God and you're that merciful, why is all these things happening? Why are all these things happening in the world? For God cannot behold sin. God cannot behold sin. And that's why a lot of people find it difficult to live right. And we're very, easy. Now, these days, we are easy to, we romance on righteousness, on godliness. We make excuses. It's just because there is no excuse for unholy living. But we have started to kind of romance these things. But God would avenge you. If you stand for truth and righteousness, heaven will back you up. So God would avenge you. So rest in us. He is coming with a flame of fire. It will be a damnable day. It will be an awful day for those who have turned their backs on Christ. The Lord is coming back powerfully. So don't argue with them. They are going to get what's coming to them. That boss that says you cannot wear your cross at work. That boss that says you cannot go and pray. That, you know, it is coming back. But you need to stand your ground. Flip. Hell is real. The destruction is everlasting. Majority have lost the sense of what holiness is. The Bible says Isaiah saw the Lord and he said, oh my God, oh, look at me. What wretched man I am, a man of unclean lips. When you encounter God, you would realize how unholy you are. John saw God in the, in, in, in the book of Revelation. He realized that, who, who am I? And so we must understand that light and darkness can never coexist. He is holy and he is a light. And he cannot put up with sin. People have explained things away. Heaven is no longer a reality for a lot of people because we're enjoying what is happening here. We have bought the trappings of the world. But sin puts a chain of events into action. If you look at Luke chapter 16, this is just buttresses, the story of, the, of Lazarus and the, and the rich man. The, the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, please have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. Hell is real. Hopelessness and anguish prevails in hell. And we must not be there, counted amongst the people that are going there. These days that we're in, people justify sin too much. We, have, we chuck, we laugh at it. It's become joke. In fact, people say, go to hell. We are loose with words. This is the season. This is the time where we need to get our heart. Be alert. Yeah, the Bible says, be ye holy as he is holy. Let's not compromise our stance. Let's not compromise our faith. Listen to me, my brother, my sister. Calvary was uncomfortable for Jesus. He was very, he died a gruesome death. Well, he did it to secure your salvation, to secure my salvation. Now is our time. He was judged on our behalf. So we must stand at alert that really we cannot miss this rapture 
because of the tribulation that will face the people that are renouncing God, that have turned their backs on him, we cannot, that we are children of light. Let's live in that consciousness. Let's live in that reality. God help us. You know, he says, and God, verse 7 says, and God will provide rest for those who are being persecuted. And also for us, when the Lord appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in a flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. But he says for us, when he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people. That's us. Praise from all who believe. And this includes you, for you believed when we told you about him. Do you believe tonight? Do you believe tonight? And so we must ensure that we keep on praying and asking our God to enable us to live a life this is a huge prayer that honestly, if you do not take anything away tonight, verse 11 must be your prayer, morning, afternoon, and night. That to keep on praying for ourselves, asking God to enable us to live a life worthy of his call. And may he give me the power to accomplish all the good things his faith prompts me to do. Then the name of the Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way I live. And you will be honored along him. This is made possible because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. My brother, and my sister, I hope tonight I could have come to you and ignored all this and spoken to you about, you know, the love of God, the mercy of God, the faithfulness of God, the kindness of God. And those things are there and they are real. But there is yet another side that a lot of the times we shy away from, that we do not want to reckon with. You know, a lot of the times we want to fit God into our own life. We want to make God in our own image. <laughs> we want to bring him into, bring him to our level. But no, that's not, there is a higher call. We were made in his image. We were made in his likeness. And we must live as such. So do you trust him? If you trust him completely, then you know there is hope for your salvation. You put on that armor of faith. You put on that armor of love. You put on that helmet, that hope of salvation, knowing that he is coming soon. And when he comes, would he find you standing? Is our life worth living, living as children of light and not, and not of darkness, children of day? Are we asleep when we're meant to be awake? Is destiny beckoning on us? Are we just games? And that's why. You know, the Bible doesn't waste words. The work with God is a serious thing. It requires discipline. It requires long suffering. It requires dedication. And that's why when he talks about what you need, he's using battle armory. You know, armor. Because he knows there is a battle. This world we live in is only temporary. You and I are only passing through. Are we living like we're passing through, like it's a temporary place, or we're living like this is where it ends? I am going to die here and enjoy here. What is your story tonight? Are you staying alert? And I pray by the Holy Spirit that God will touch each and every one of us, that we live a life worthy of his call. We live a life of obedience to the word. We live a life of, you know, being sober, being diligent, being prayerful. He says, pray without ceasing. We always must pray. He says, rejoice in, always rejoice in hope. When you know there is a hope, you cannot be downcast because you know, even this life affliction, they have been, you have been diagnosed with this, all these things, those things for you to go through. And he says, he builds in you character. What character are you building? And he says, it is possible. The last uh, verse of that second Thessalonians, by his grace. Grace makes all the difference. Grace changes everything for you. Because in your walking life, you have not been left alone. We have the Holy Spirit, but grace is a lubricant. That is a catalyst, is what we need and what we require. And we run into that grace every single day into that mercy of God. Lord, I can come and say to you, God is loving, he's faithful, he's magnificent, he's impossibility specialist, he does all those things. But there is this side of him that we must not never forget. So I pray tonight 
that all of you have taken something away from this tonight, from this message, from this teaching. And you know, we would live a life. That chapter, verse 11 to 12, second, that we would live a life worthy of his call. You know, that he will, uh, that, that he will enable our life, live a life worthy of his call. And he will give us the power to accomplish all the good things that faith prompts us to do. Then the name of the Lord, you will not bring disrepute to God in the name of Jesus. You will not bring disgrace or dishonor to the name of Christ. You will profess him and you will live a life worthy of being called a child of God. And honor will be restored to you in Jesus' name. He says, this is possible by the grace of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you tonight. Thank you for the time of the word. Thank you for the time that we have shared tonight. I pray that every single one of us will take hold of this word and run with it in the mighty name of Jesus. Most especially will be alert, will be on guard. We will stand firm. We will be serious. We will pray without season. We will be grateful always, oh God, and not knowing with the consciousness of heaven on our hearts, every waking moment of the day. We know you are coming soon. And Father Lord, we will be ready. Father, we give you praise. We worship you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for tonight. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. It's offing time. Um, I think we know that tight and offing. Thank you. So if you are going to give tonight, please do. I, I, I admonish you, you must do so. Um, so give your time, give your offering. I think the account details are above there in the chat screen. And the Lord will bless you. The Lord will honor your seed and multiply every seed you sow into this house. You know, God loves a cheerful giver. And, uh, you know, the, the giver is always blessed. And so I pray that every single one of you would do what you're supposed to do and be obedient to the call, walk worthy of his call upon your life. You will not bring disgrace or disrepute to the name of God. In Jesus' mighty name.